Did you guys enjoy last week, Chi Chi's message last week on revival? Powerful. I heard so many good things. I even heard a lot of good things about worship and the message last week. It's amazing how I leave town and everyone goes, the message was great, worship, everything was amazing. And so I was, it felt good, then I was like, wow, it's like, do y'all say that when I'm in town or just, okay, anyways. Uh, but, but I'm so thankful uh, to have just a great team um, that, that is carrying the torch for this ministry. You know, it's cool because I don't look old at all, as you can tell, but Chi Chi was in my youth group, and it just blesses me so much to see from when he was, you know, 17 years old and away from God. He got saved under our ministry. He's light. He got on fire for the Lord. And then to see him stand up here and teach the word like he does blesses me. And now he's teaching my kids. It's neat that I was his youth pastor, and he, now he's my boy's youth pastor. So you sow and you reap. Amen. Uh, but I want to just kind of go over his five points. I'm not going to preach about them. I just want to reiterate what he said because I'm going to pick up right where he left off and take it to another level today and keep teaching you on this. Now, I'm going to give you the title of my sermon first. And I want you to write this down because I have not taught this exact angle before of what I'm going to teach today. But as you know, the financial series seminar is coming this Saturday, and the Lord put it on my heart to teach on finances the week before to prepare you for what's coming. Because we will realize in just a moment, I'm going to prove to you from Scripture, that the financial money test is the first stage or the first test in your walk with God. If you don't pass this test, you will not progress spiritually in this life. It's that serious. So the title of the sermon is The First Stage of Spiritual Growth. The First Stage of Spiritual Growth. If you want to grow spiritually, you must start here. Now, last week, Chi Chi talked about revival. We've been talking about revival. We, we see what's happening all around the nation, the world right now, and I've been praying about that. And as you know, about a month ago, God gave me a vision. First time it's ever happened to me like this in my life. I've had dreams before, but never a vision like this. And he's preparing us for what he's going to do in the earth. And Chi Chi talked about there's a recipe for revival. He said, number one, the first part is repentance. Number two, then he said prayer. Three is recognize resistance. Four is holiness. And number five is discipleship. And I want to just prepare you for what I'm going to say today because what I'm going to say today is going to shift how you think about the kingdom of God. First of all, I want to reiterate here because I think we need the same foundation every Sunday. If you're new here or you haven't heard me teach on this before, Christianity is not a religion. I want to make sure you understand that because nowhere in Scripture are we taught that we're just another religion in the list of world religions. A religion is a way of doing things. It's a list of what to do and what not to do that conforms to a way of believing. Can I tell you, Jesus didn't say, I came to bring the religion of God to the earth. He said, I came to bring the kingdom of God to the earth. And when you understand that we are a kingdom, first of all, you'll understand all Scripture. It will begin to make sense now because if you read it as a religious book, it will confuse you. Because you'll say, well, why did he say it that way? When you understand we're a kingdom and God is a king, Come on, Jesus isn't a religious leader. He's a king, the king of kings. And this will kind of get your perspective correct. And so we're talking about a kingdom that Jesus came to bring to the earth. And I just want to do this real quick. So let me just reiterate this. Revival is a result. Let me say this clearly. Revival is a result of putting God first place or the preeminence of God in the hearts of his people. So revival is not something God waits to do to all of a sudden just go, now I'm going to do it because I wanted to see how long they can go without it, and now I'm going to surprise the world and I'm going to show up and do great things. No, revival is a response. It's a result of us putting God back in his rightful place in our personal lives and in our hearts as first place, preeminent, above all else. And when God is first in the hearts of his people, then there's a reaction that takes place And now, once again, revival is not the result of what God does. Revival is the result of what we do. And so it's important that we recognize that we instigate a revival. It's when there's a resurrection that happens in our hearts when God is now in his rightful place. We are looking away from the distractions of the world and putting our eyes back on God. And so I want to say that because a lot of times we think in 
religion that everything is on God and it's up to him when he does and how he does things and we just wait for him to do it. And the problem with that, the reason it's not true is because all the blame now goes to God. And if nothing happens, God didn't do it. Why didn't God show up? And we blame God. And the whole time God says, your faith moves me. So I'm waiting on you to activate what I've already given you at the cross. And kingdom changes your perspective. Now, why are we talking about money today? Money is not a good word in church. A lot of times you don't hear that. Sometimes preachers get nervous when they, and they say finances or the blessing or they'll use all these spiritual words instead of money. But can I tell you today, I want to teach you what God has to say about money because it is the first test in your spiritual growth. In your walk with God, money is the first stage that, that you must understand and master before you can move forward in your spiritual growth, and I will prove it from Scripture. You know, it's funny because uh, in all the years of ministry I've seen, and I've been a part of different ministries, different churches, and the, the majority of prayer requests that came, I mean, whether it's through phone calls or requests, even at Lights Church, the majority of prayer requests are, are centered around two subjects. Number one, they're centered around finances or money financial needs, deficits, I need a miracle financially, and number two, healing. Some sort of healing need or financial need. These are the top two. Now, I want to tell you something that's shocking to you. Do you know in the entire Bible, there's approximately 500 verses on prayer? That's a lot of verses, 500. That's in Old and New Testament. There's also approximately 500 verses on faith. So in the entire Bible, you have 500 verses on prayer, 500 verses on faith, and guess how many verses there are on money? Are you ready for this? 2,350 verses in the Bible on money. Now, if you took that at face value, you would almost say, does God value money more than faith and prayer? How come he talks about it four and a half times almost, five times more than he does faith and prayer? Why is that? Let me say this. It's not because God values money. It's because humans value money, and God values us, and he wants your heart. And so God says if you can have a right relationship with money, then your heart is in the right place for me to operate in and through your life. And so the reason God has to talk about money five times more than faith and prayer is because if you don't master that and understand your relationship with money, then you will not be able to operate on a higher level of prayer and faith. Number one, first test, first stage in your walk with God is financial test, the financial test. Some of y'all are getting nervous. You're like, tell me he's not. Yeah, I'm going to talk about it today. Here we go. Now, Jesus has 38 parables he talked about in Scripture, 38 parables. 16 of the parables of Jesus are on money and finances. That's almost half of everything Jesus taught publicly was on our relationship with money and finances. The average person spends 90,000 hours of their lives working for money. When you expire, you take your last breath, the average person spent 90,000 hours of their entire life working so that they could get more money. So why is God talking about money so much? Because the majority of our life is spent getting more of it. And if you don't understand that money isn't your, pro your provider, money is not the answer to what you need, and you're spending that much of your life working to get more of it, then God has to make sure we understand the right relationship so that we can move forward in God. If we want revival and God to move in our lives and a resurrection in your marriage or in your relationship with God or in your business or whatever it is, when, when we step into revival, if we don't master this and money is still an idol in our lives, then we will never see resurrection power in our lives because we are serving a different God. You know, the Bible says, Jesus even said it this way, you can only serve God or mammon. You can't serve both. That's a powerful statement. So if we don't understand that we serve God and not mammon, the spirit of money, then what does that mean? If we don't know that, then we will never get to stage two in our walk with God. Why? Because that must be understood before anything else. So the Bible's so clear about your spiritual health is connected to your relationship with money. And if you don't have a good relationship with money, your spiritual health is not good. Now, I'm going to give you a little test today, and we're going to talk through this, and we're going to see where we are on this 
scale of spiritual health, if you will. Now, I'm not going to do it in front of everybody. I won't make you stand up. But just in your heart, I want you to take this test as I go through it today. Now, how many of you remember five weeks ago, I talked about the vision that God gave me? Did anyone, were you here? Did you see that online? If you, if you haven't, I want you to go back on YouTube or on Facebook after this service, maybe this afternoon, and watch the message entitled, I think it's called, My Vision from God. And what I talked about is the first time in my life I've had dreams, I've heard God's voice, I've all kind of experiences with God, but I'd never had something this real and this supernatural happen to me in my entire life until five weeks ago. And I had a real vision from God, so much so that I didn't know if I was really in my house or if I wasn't, and I'm not over-spiritualizing this, I'm just telling you how it happened to me. And it was in the middle of the night, and yes, my body was asleep, but the reason I don't believe it was a dream is because the reality of this was I've had some crazy... Have you ever had a dream that you woke up thinking it happened? How many of you had a good dream you woke up and you're like, it happened like you won the lottery or something like that? I have this recurring dream that I can dunk. Anyone else have that dream? It's just a passion. I've always wanted to be able to dunk, and I was really into basketball as a kid, and so I have this weird dream that I can dunk, and it's the happiest times of my life when I have this dream. And I don't just dunk, but I'm like at a rec center or something, and I walk in. It's like the movies. Everybody's like, look at this guy. He can't play, and I'm all just kind of going in like undercover, and then I'm like, hey, can I play? And they're like, no, you're terrible. And then somebody says, let him in. There's no one else. And then all of a sudden, I just go off on everybody, and I'm like flying over their heads. I'm dunking. I mean, I'm ripping the back board down everything it's the and I wake up smiling sometimes and I'm like yes it finally happened and then after like five minutes I kind of shake out of it I'm like it was a dream and then I sink down into a sadness that I've been in for many years because I can't so but I've had dreams to where you wake up and you think man that was real this was an entirely different experience so much so that I woke up at 3 14 a.m and I was weeping uncontrollably in the few Don't know why you need to watch this sermon about what happened. But whenever I talked to the angel and I heard what God said and and how he thinks about us, it overwhelmed me. And one of the things in the vision I want to just point to is there were three spirits, if you will, in this vision. And God was showing me the strategy of the enemy against the people of God in the last days. And these three spirits were the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And he said, these three spirits, if you will, are on an all-out attack on the church. And they are trying to distract and to pull down the people of God through one of these three areas. What is the lust of the eyes? Lust of the eyes is materialism. It's finances, money, seeking things of this world, looking everywhere but to God for provision and wanting earthly things and earthly material things. And then the lust of the flesh is the, the sexual sin and lust of the flesh and, and fornication and adultery and pornography and this, this sin of, of fleshly desires. And then the pride of life is pride. The Bible says there's a few things that God really hates and pride's at the top of the list. That's self-sufficiency. That's I can do it by myself. I'm better than them. I'm better than him. I know what I'm doing. It's independence from God. And these three spirits are attacking all of us. And some of you, as I said, that are like, yeah, I definitely know that spirit. We all have been tempted or attacked in these areas. Why? Because they are the overarching categories that the enemy attacks people with in this life. Why? To distract them from the things of God. So I woke up at 314, and I was weeping uncontrollably, and so much so that I had to get out of the bed because I thought Courtney's going to wake up and wonder what in the world is going on here. And I just had uh, just a moment with God like I've never had before. And God began to show me that uh, through revelation, through conversations, that 314 was significant. I, I don't know why I remember the time I looked at it until I realized that in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, it starts the conversation that Jesus has with the church of Laodicea. And in Revelation 2 and 3, these are uh, conversations and corrections that Jesus has with seven different churches. And I want you to read here with me in Revelation 3, 14. We're going to read through 19. What was he talking about? What was the main purpose of this conversation? It says in verse 14, To the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of of God. This is Jesus. I know your works, that you're neither hot or cold. Or your translation might say cold or hot. I read that backwards. I, I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, 
warm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now that is God speaking. That's a pretty extreme way of saying something. God is saying, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now look at verse 17. Because, say because. Okay, so why does God want to vomit them out of his mouth? This is the reason. Because you say, I'm rich. I have become wealthy. I have need of nothing. And do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now listen what he says. Here is the solution. I am counseling you to buy from me. Say, buy from me. So he's saying, you are rich in your own self. You are looking to the economy, to this world, materialism, lust of the eyes, everything else you are going to as provider, and you are now independent from your God. And he said, that cannot be tolerated in my kingdom. Because when you're in a kingdom, the king is in charge. He has all authority. There's no voting. There's no Congress. There's no nothing like that. It's so hard for the Western church to understand this because we are capitalists. We think in terms of the democracy and republic and voting, and we all have an equal say and equal share, and everybody's voice matters. And can I say something that's kind of harsh? In the kingdom, your opinion doesn't matter. Only the king's opinion matters in the kingdom. And the reason a kingdom, we have a bad taste in our mouth of kingdom, say, well, the kingdom is not, that's not a good way of doing government. It's because it all depends on the righteousness of the king. And so if you had a wicked king, you have abuse at the highest level. But when you have a righteous, perfect, and holy king, you have the healthiest government ever created. And we are a part of a kingdom. And God says, if you are not looking to me to provide for you, then you cannot operate in my kingdom. You have to be moved out. Now, the kingdom of God is not salvation, by the way. Do you know you can be saved and going to heaven and not operating in God's kingdom? God's kingdom is his way of doing and being right. So God's way of doing things is his kingdom. You can accept Jesus and know him as Savior, and that's where your revelation of Jesus stops, and you will experience nothing else God has for you except salvation. And it's so sad how many people, because religion has deceived us, that the only purpose Jesus came to die on the cross for is so that we don't have to go to hell, and now we're just waiting to die so that we can go to heaven. And we have songs about, man, I can't wait to get out of this earth. If God's will was just for you to go to heaven, then the moment you said yes to Jesus, you would have been raptured out and taken straight to heaven. But God says, that's not the only thing I came for. You are now my representative, my ambassador, my body in the earth. And I want to do through you what I was doing when I was on this earth. So once again, he says in verse 15, uh, 18, buy from me. So he says, come back to me as your provider. Gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich white in white garments so that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, if God loves you, how many think God loves you? Come on, raise your hand. God loves me. All right, if he loves you, he rebukes and chastens us. That's not a popular thing. God's like, oh, you need some correction? It's because I love you. How many of your parents told you it's because I love you when, the, when you got a spanking and you never understood that? And now you have kids and you say the same thing. And they're like, I don't get it. The pain does not show love to me. I don't understand how that is love. But they can only see what's right in front of their face. Whenever you are a loving parent and you can see past this season of their life in this moment, you can prepare them for success. God says, because I love you, I'm going to correct you. How does God correct us? Number one, with his word. He says, I'm going to say some things to you. My word is so sharp, it will cut you. Sometimes God needs to tell you something. You need to hear the truth because you have been denying or deceived or the enemy has got you distracted. And God says, I'm going to say something that will hurt, but it's because I love you. Stop that. What did he tell the woman? He didn't condemn the woman caught in adultery. Everybody else wanted to stone her. But what did he say? I forgive you. I don't condemn you. Stop doing that. It's wrong, I don't condemn you. And because of the truth and the love that he had for her, it delivered her instantly. Religion just wants you to hear, stop doing that, and doesn't see the love. But you can get in the other ditch where it's just loosey-goosey, everything, grace all the time, and there's no correction. And so you say, we can all do whatever we want because God is just so full of grace that he just doesn't care what you do on this earth as long as you believe in Jesus. And there is a wise, narrow road, the Bible says. It's the balance of the grace and the love of God. And once you understand that, you'll have victory in your life. So he says, I rebuke them. Now, Laodicea, just so you know, was one of the most successful, best, powerful economic cities in the world at the time. 
And it was interesting because he talked about their clothing. He talked about eye salve. He talked about gold. They were a place to where they were the clothing capital of the world. The nicest clothes, the majority of clothing came from Laodicea. This is where they uh, made clothes and they distributed them. They had one of the best, it was, like imagine in New York City as far as like all of the financial uh, places were all based out of Laodicea. They were a wealthy, modern city that was in a strong economy. And that's dangerous sometimes because they came to a place, even the church, to where they trusted in the economy of their city more than they did the provider and their God. And Jesus said, you cannot be tolerated and operate in my kingdom if that's how you think. If I'm not your provider, you can't serve God and mammon. So you're not serving me, you're serving mammon. And that must be corrected. Now, I want to say something that's going to shock some of you. I, one of my favorite teachers on the subject of finances is Miles Monroe. Actually, he's one of my favorite teachers, period. But, uh, and so I've heard some sermons that he talked about, and there's some powerful things I've heard him say on finances. And I want to incorporate some of what he said today because I think there's, there's no better way to say it than the way he taught it. And I want to share some of that with you today. I'm going to say something that's going to shock some of you. And before you get upset... Listen to me explain it through the word, okay? Because I love doing this, but it's a very strong statement. Are you ready for this? Well, let me just say it. I'm going to pre you it so you don't freak out completely. Besides God, I'm going to say that now, because if you're religious, you're not going to like this. Besides God, we know he's all-powerful. He's the great I am. Besides him, money is the most powerful force in the earth. Money is the most powerful force in this earth outside of the kingdom of God. Why does God talk about it five times more than everything else? Because it's the most powerful force on earth. And I'll prove it to you from Scripture. Let's read Matthew 6, 24. It says, <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking. No one, say no one. no one. This is impossible. So you are not the only one that can. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Why is money the most powerful force on earth outside of God? Because there are only two masters on this earth, Jesus said. He said, either God is your master, your king, or money, mammon. He said, that's the only choice. So if you don't understand how to handle mammon, money, and I'll explain what mammon means in a moment, but if you can't handle money in this life, then you're either serving it or you're serving me. And there's no gray area. It's not like, well, I'm kind of serving God, but I'm not really serving money. You're serving one or the other. That's a powerful statement. 1 Timothy 6.10 talks about the love of money. You ever heard this scripture? The love of money is the what? Root of all evil. That's a powerful statement. If money is the most powerful force on earth, it, it makes sense then that the love of it is the root of all evil. What does that mean? It doesn't just mean, you know, looking for money is, uh, is the most evil thing ever. It means you are taking all of your trust outside of God and placing it in an idol, and that is the beginning of every evil thing because you've come out of God's authority and a covering, and now you're under a false God that only breeds destruction in your lives and will lead you into darkness. And he said, it is dangerous. So I'm going to talk about it five times more in Scripture because you must know how to handle it. And I think sometimes in the church we get nervous because, well, we don't want to talk about money, you know, because people always say, all oh, those preachers are all about money. Listen, I, you do whatever God wants you to do. Don't tithe. That's up to you. I'm going to tell you what God said. You need to put it, your finances in his hands. But it doesn't, I don't get like a new car and a raise every time you tithe, okay? It's not about me. You know, it's about you and your walk with God. This is his church. He'll pay for everything. We're doing it debt free. So if it's $100 million, God will pay for it. Our $6 million building, God's going to pay for that too. Already has. So whatever I'm saying today is not to get you to give more at the end of the service. Trust me. I, was, I thought the same way and was burned out on that mess because I grew up in the 80s and saw every last TV show and late night preacher talking about money all the time. I thought, they're all out for our money. Can I tell you something? If you don't have a right relationship with money, you will never advance in your walk with God. You are frozen and paralyzed in this moment. And not only that, destruction will begin to go throughout every place in your life. Why? Because you can't serve him and money. Pick one. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on. That was too harsh. Okay, so we read in Matthew 6, 24. He said, you can't serve God and mammon. Now, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase for sake of time, but in verses 25 through 33, you know Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. So he just says, you can't serve God and mammon. And then Jesus says, he begins to talk about, don't worry about what you're going to wear or about what you're going to eat or all the provision of this life because your father knows you have need of them. And he said he will provide for you. He, look at the birds. He provides for them. He'll provide for you. So Jesus is saying, look, you can't serve God and mammon, so don't worry. If you're serving God, he will provide everything you need in this life for you. So when you're serving him, you will have no need because he will provide for all of your needs. Jesus is the provider of your needs. So there should be no lack when you're serving him. There might be an appearance of lack, but he will never fail you when you're serving him. Some of you might have been in lack for many years of your life and never enough, and it might be that you have not been serving him, and it's why you've been in lack for so long. And I can say this boldly and not be judgmental because I have been in this place in life where I decided to serve money without realizing it instead of God. It became my source, and I was in lack after lack after lack. I never had enough. I was frustrated. I was always falling short, and the Lord had to correct me and say, it's not because I haven't provided it for you. It's because you are not looking to me, and you had no idea that you had erected an idol of mammon in your life. You must look to him as your provider. Now, what is mammon? We say that a lot, and you say, why do you say mammon and then money? Well, mammon uh, originally was the Syrian god of riches and provision. So it was one of the idols that started many, many, many thousands of years ago. It was Nimrod. You know, in Genesis 6, there's a guy named Nimrod. He was a great leader. Uh, A lot of things, man, if you ever want to, if you're like a conspiracy person, I'm telling you, just study Nimrod, you'll be shocked how much that we don't aren't taught in church about Nimrod. Maybe I should do a whole sermon on Nimrod because he's not who you think he is. I mean, Nimrod is still connected to this generation in this day and time. But let me just say this. So Mammon was Nimrod's chosen god. And Mammon is the god of provision and money and riches. So anytime they needed provision, they looked to Mammon above all. Because you had Baal, that was the god of rain. You had all these other gods, but Mammon was the overall god who provides. And all these under gods, if you will, provided for specific things. But Mammon is the one that they all worship. Now, here's something amazing. Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel, they said something that's very interesting. They said, we're going to build this tower because let us make a name for ourselves. They were saying, pride, by the way pride of life. They were getting out from the covering of God who provides and says, we can provide for ourselves. We're going to erect a tower that is a a representation of our independence from God. We can do it all. And they were so advanced. This is your conspiracy stuff. They were such an advanced society. I want you to hear this. This is before the flood. Such an advanced society that they began to build a tower to the heavens and God had to confuse their language because he said nothing will be impossible to them. And so he wiped out the advancement of their technologies, brought it back down to zero, and today we're not quite back to where they were in Nimrod's time. Just to be thinking about how advanced they were. He had to, the flood wiped out everybody. Now, you can go study that for yourself because I'm not going to go into that. But Babel, the Tower of Babel, is where we get the word Babylon from. And Babylon, or the Babylonian system or economy, is what America and the West is built on today. It's the, it's the, the debt system. The, the, I mean, everything we do financially has its roots in the Babylonian system. And I'm not saying everything financial is evil. Hear me. I'm not going extreme and saying, get out of the banks and never do this, and you can't borrow for your house. What I am saying is, if you're looking to money as your provider, then you're serving it. But you can use money as a tool And recognize it's not your source. Money is simply a tool to increase the kingdom and to bless people's lives. That's all it is. It's not a treasure. It's a tool. And once you get that relationship with money down, God can trust you with more. I'll prove it here in a moment. So here's what's really cool. So Nimrod uh, worshipped mammon, and he brought it to the entire world. And here's the craziest thing. You ready for this? Mammon was the god of the ancient Chaldeans. And here's the coolest thing. Abraham's father, Terah, was Nimrod's chief minister and idol maker. 
And so God calls the son of Nimrod's chief maker of the idol of Mammon and all his under gods, he calls his son Abraham, who was Abram at the time, and he says, I'm choosing you. And he said, here's what needs to happen. You have to leave the spirit of Mammon before I can bless you. And once you get out from under the covering of mammon and your father's idolatry, then watch what I can do through a life that's totally committed to me. And can I tell you, it's still the same call today. You have to leave the spirit of mammon before the blessing of God can move through your life. So maybe you've been paralyzed and not blessed and not increased because you're under that spirit of mammon today. And God says, I will not bless you in this place. Let no man say he's made you rich except God Almighty. That was Abraham's prayer. So what do you do? Get out from under your father's house. Get out from under that idolatry of mammon and go to a place and I will bless you there. And once again, he said, I will bless you. Mammon doesn't provide for you. I will bless you. And I'll bless you so much that the entire generations of the world after you will all recognize because of the faith that you had in me and not in mammon, my blessing for you will change the face of the earth forever. And Jesus, the Messiah, came through the lineage of Abram. He started something that we're still impacting us today because he left mammon and followed the one true God who provides. Genesis 14, 22, let's read. Um, it says here in verse 22 and 23, but Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, verse 23, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours lest you or anyone else should say, I have made Abraham rich. What's he saying? He's saying, I want everyone to know because this is what God taught me. God is my provider. Let no man, no thing, no idol say they blessed me except the one true God. This is why he was so wealthy, not just physically, financially wealthy, but in every way, blessed and wealthy in God. Genesis 13, 2. Was Abraham wealthy? Not just spiritually. He was wealthy in every way. Let's look at Genesis 13, 2, and then we'll read verses 5 and 6. It says, Abram was very rich. Say, very rich. How would you like that to be your biography? You know, Michael was very rich. You know, like there's rich, and then there's very rich. And then there's stinking rich, and then there's nasty rich. You know, like there's a certain level where you're just like, people are so rich, it's just not even right. You're like, how in the world? I mean, we don't even realize how much a billion dollars is. You know why I can talk about money in church, and everybody gets, oh, he said a billion, he said money, he said rich. Why? Because money is not my God. It's a tool. And I can have it or not have it, I'm blessed and God takes care of me. And I can say that to you because I've faced the decision to give everything I've had away twice in my life and I passed the test. Not because I'm great, not because I'm amazing, but because God revealed to me that he will provide. If I trust him, he will never allow lack or deficiency in my life. And so it's easy. I could do it a third time. If the Lord tells me, I'll give it all the way again. I've done it twice already. doesn't matter to me. Why? Because mammon doesn't provide for me. So look at this. He was very rich in livestock, and by the way, silver and gold. Let's go to verse 5. Lot also, who went with Abraham. Now, here's what's amazing. Lot did not have the covenant like Abram had, but because he was with Abram, This is called increase by association. This is a spiritual law that you see all throughout Scripture. When the blessing of God is on somebody's life, when you just get near that person, you it will be like an overflow. You will see favor and blessing. It says, Lot who went with him had flocks, herds, and tents, verse 6. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Now that is the blessing of God in increase. They couldn't even be in the same area because they had too much. Why could God trust Abraham with that much? Because he trusted God with everything that he had. So Mammon's the idol of provision. Now here's a little prophecy teaching for you before I get into this series I want to do soon on the end times. Mammon is the God who provides for you. Okay, here's your prophecy teaching. Do you know what the Bible says in the last days before Jesus returned for his church? What's going to happen? The Antichrist is going to rule the earth, and he's going to use one tool in particular to control everybody, and it's called the mark of the beast. And what does that mark mean? That's in Revelation 14. The mark of the beast is a mark on the hand or the forehead of every person that that takes it that enables them to provide for themselves and their families. You can't buy or sell. You can't get food. You can't buy a car, a house, anything. You cannot gain provision unless you have the mark of the beast. 
So what's it saying? In the last days, the Antichrist is going to rule just like Nimrod, in the same spirit of Nimrod, by the spirit of mammon. And it's the spirit of provision outside of God, who is the great I am, your provider. And so everything is being structured in the earth to get us dependent on everything else but God. The Babylonian system of finance is to get you outside of dependence on God as your creator and to look to banks and people and jobs and everything else to gain sustenance and provision for you and your family. And today is the day that you choose. I'm either going to look to the world system or I'm going to look to the Father to provide for me. And it's a choice that you make internally that now bleeds out, if you will, into external choices in your life. So they were, the Antichrist is going to try to replace God as provider in these last days. So your relationship with money reveals who you're serving. I'll say this again. It's powerful. Your relationship with money will reveal who you're serving. Now, I want to read Matthew chapter 6. This is, this is what I wanted to get to today. I, this is going to be so good here. I love this part. All right, we're going to read Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. Now, we read Matthew 6, 24 earlier about you can either serve God or mammon. You can't serve God and mammon. So let's just back up a few verses to verse 19. It says, Jesus speaking again, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, before I go any further, I want to say something. When he says lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, I want to just define this. It doesn't mean somehow, you know, you've got to lay up treasures physically in heaven, right? How do you get your treasure to heaven? He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And so what is he saying? Jesus is saying, if you want to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, then you take your earthly treasure and you place it in the kingdom. You say, God, it is now submitted to you, the kingdom of God. Now what I have here is yours. Lord, it's yours to command, Father. You're my provider. The reason we tithe is not because God needs 10% of your money because he's going broke. The reason we tithe is because we are taking and submitting. The 10% purifies the 100%, the other 90. And so we are purifying it and saying, God, this 10% represents everything I have. It's under your authority. And unless you do that, you are keeping that outside of the authority of God, and you can't serve God and money, so you're either serving him or mammon. And if you don't place it under him, then you're keeping it under a curse, an idol. And so it's important that we recognize that we must trust, let me say it this way, entrust our finances to God. You can trust, but entrust comes with a physical action. Trust is internal, entrust is internal that leads to a physical response. And saying, God, I trust you. Now, in verse 22, in the same chapter, it says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Now, this, these two verses used to confuse me until I understood the context. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, if you read that by itself, you can try to interpret that and come up with a million different weird things. I was like, what? If your eye is bad, then your body is dark, and if the light is dark, how great is the dark? And it used to confuse me until I read the context and realized he's talking about money. And he said, if your eye is bad, what does that mean? If your eye is beholding mammon as treasure, because he just finished talking about treasure, then your whole life is inviting uh, darkness into it. If your eye is not beholding the treasure of mammon, then you are now bringing light into every area of your life because the love of money is the root of all evil and darkness. So if you're beholding mammon in your life, then you have a root that will produce the fruit of darkness in your life. So everything grows out of the root. And so if you can uproot it by taking the love of money out and giving the love of God instead of the love of money, then now everything in your life will be coming from light and the fruit of your life will be representative of the God that you serve. And so it is the first test in your spiritual growth. Now, y'all aren't as excited about this as other sermons today, but I'm telling you, we have to know that we're talking about revival and God says, you want revival? If you're not serving me, I'm not gonna give you revival. Why? Because you got to bring your whole life, your heart, your attitude, your emotions, your marriage, your kids, your family, your finances, everything under me. Then I can bless and increase you and resurrect life in you. 
but if you are not serving me, then I'm not going to bless you in a place that's a cursed place because it will keep you in a place of curse. So I have to uproot that and move you into a blessed place in your life. It is the beginning. You know the parable of the talents. I'm not going to read it today. How many of you heard that before? Matthew chapter 24, excuse me, 25, uh, talks about the parable of the talents. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God looks like this. So this is a picture of the kingdom. He said, a man uh, is going away for a time to a far country, and he calls his servants together, and he gives one ten talents. Now, a talent back then is approximately $1,000 in today's equivalents in money. So he gave one guy $10,000. This is money, by the way. Now, we can preach this parable from a, a lot of different ways about stewardship, but it's talking about money because a talent was $1,000. So he said he gave one of them $10,000. He gave one of them $5,000, and he gave another one uh, $2,000 or $1,000, one talent. There's two different parables of this one, and I'm not reading it. But anyways, and he gave them all different amounts, and he said, I want you, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to ask for an account when I get back. So they all had their entrustments, if you will. They all had that money that he gave them. And, of course, you know the story. The one that had ten multiplied it, and uh, he gained ten more. And the one that had five invested it with the banks and increased that five, and it was, became $10,000. And the one that had one was scared that he would lose it, and he knew my master was a hard man that reaps where he doesn't sow, and so I'm just going to bury this. And when he comes back, I'm going to give it back to him what he gave me, and at least I can say I didn't lose your one talent. Now, if we look from a Western mind, that doesn't look so bad because we're in a different mentality here. We're thinking, that's not a big deal. He cared so much about his master that he didn't want to lose that $1,000. So he loved him so much, he buried it so he could not lose it. But the master reacted very differently when he came back. You know what happened whenever the, the master came back, he gave a count and he said, well done to the one that made $10,000 more. And he said, you are good and fa He calls faithfulness, good management of money equals faithfulness to God. He said, you want me to define faithful for you? Now, here's where we miss it. We got to go with scripture. God defines faithfulness as being faithful in your management of money first. It's funny because we can, religion super spiritualize it and say, well, Lord, I don't trust you with my money, but I pray more than anyone. I came to church two hours early, Lord. I sang louder. I, whenever they said, uh, what's that song? You know, come out of the grave. Nobody else danced, Lord. I came up front and came out of the grave, Lord. I wasn't ashamed of you. I waved my hands, God. I prayed in tongues for eight hours. I came to every prayer thing, and I had every revival meeting ever. I was there. And, Lord, I love you. But my money's not yours, Lord. God says, wicked, unfaithful. That's a strong word. He said, because the first test in your spiritual growth, the first stage that you must pass, and if you don't pass it, you'll never graduate to stage two, is the money test. Because you can't serve me and mammon. It's not because God needs it. but And I'll tell you something. It's the hardest thing to do when you go from serving mammon to not serving mammon. Because everything in this world, especially in America today, is built around mammon. It's the Babylonian system. And so it's hard for us to unplug from being fed by that and to totally plug into the kingdom of God. It's scary. Because you're going from no faith in God as your provider to faith in God. And you're like, I love God. I've been saved for 35 years. Pastor, I, I, I pray all the time. I read my Bible. That's great. You know him as Savior, but you don't know him as provider. And you cannot serve him and mammon. And so you have stopped the heavens over your life. And I'm telling you, I want to see revival in the church today more than anything else. And I, get past money for a second. Anything else you look to other than God is an idol in our lives, and we have to unplug. That vision God gave me said those three spirits are attacking, and we've got to get out from under that and give everything back to him. That's a humility. God, my marriage, Lord, my money, my body, God, my dreams, my vision, my ambitions, Lord, it's all yours. You are my king. You're my provider, God. All he wants is a heart turned toward him. He looks at the heart. God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. And since you value money, it's important to him to talk to you about it because he's the, the most important thing. So here's what's amazing. In this parable, I want to say a truth that's going to change how you see everything. God always will give you the stewardship test before he brings increase into your life. You have to pass the test of stewardship. What's a steward? That's an old King James word. Steward simply means, I looked it up, a person employed to manage another's property. So if you're a steward, if the master said, here, you're becoming stewards. Now, whose money was it that the three guys got? Wasn't their money. 
It was the master's money. Why? Because we're in a kingdom. He said the kingdom of God is like. Can I tell you something about kingdoms? In a kingdom, everything is the king's. Every dollar, every coin, every piece of gold, every tree, the land, everything in a kingdom is the king's. And anything an individual possesses is a gift or an entrustment or they're a steward of the king's property because it's a kingdom. That's, it's hard for us because some of you are like, I don't, it's, it's almost mind-blowing for a Western mind because we're like, that's not the way life is. Like, no, that's, some of you are like, that's socialism. That's terrible right there. It's not, we're not sharing everything. No, in a kingdom, it's all the kings. So guess what? Every dollar in your bank account is the king's. Your marriage is his. Your children, his. Your body, living sacrifice, acceptable to who? Him. Everything is his. And once you get that, you will begin to understand everything because now money is not yours, so it becomes easy to use as a tool because you're stewarding it for the king. And so it's not, here's how it's been preached in religious minds. The 10% is the Lord's and the 90 is yours, not in the kingdom. It's 100% the king's. And he says, return 10 to me because it will prove and verify that I am in charge of all 100 and you recognize it's all mine. And then the 90, God will increase beyond what anything could have ever happened with the 100 times 100 even because he says, once you recognize it's mine, I can trust you with an unlimited amount. So increase is preceded by a stewardship test. The modern-day word is management. To entrust means to give or to assign responsibility. Now, I wrote this down. I want to say it like God showed it to me. If you don't prove you can manage the money God has already given you, then you will not be entrusted with more. And here's what Miles Monroe said. I wish I could take credit, but I had to say, I'm going to say it once, and when I preach it in the future, I'm not giving him credit. He said, you will always lose what you mismanage. You'll always lose it. What's the parable? Take from the one that didn't manage it properly and give it to the guy with 10. Now, that doesn't make sense. That's wrong in our mindset in the West. We're like, he only had one. That guy's got 20 now. You're going to give, he has a thousand bucks. Instead of blessing the poor guy with a thousand dollars, you're going to give the rich guy with 20,000. Why? Because if you were giving someone your stuff, would you give to someone who didn't manage it properly or someone who managed it? If you're going to invest Saturday, we're going to learn about wealth investment. Are you going to choose a company that has failed and lost all their clients' money or somebody who has made money for their clients? I mean, where would you put your money? You're going to put it in the hands of those that steward it and manage it properly. So guess what? He said, you're, you don't qualify for this anymore. Why? Because you're not managing it and you'll lose what you don't manage. Now, this is harsh and you're not excited, but I'm going to go, I'm going to end it with this because this is good. I'm telling you, it's changing. It's rechanging my life. Luke 16, 11. Are you ready for this? This is the scripture that's going to home run it all the way home. This is the very end here. I got four verses to read. Let's just read two verses in Luke 16, verses 10 and 11. This is awesome. He who is faithful, this is Jesus speaking, and what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Verse 11, therefore, therefore means because of what was just said, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon or with money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What's the true riches? The spiritual things. So the first stage in your spiritual growth is money because Jesus said if you can't be faithful in unrighteous mammon then why would I trust you with the true riches so here's your first test pass it and watch what I can do through your life that's Jesus not me saying it that sums everything up right there God defines faithfulness as simply as this how we manage money because you can't serve him in money you want to be faithful to God show him faithful in that the management of money is the first test we must pass in our spiritual growth. Now, I'm going to keep reading here because I want to make sure you understand this is not me. This is God. Verses 12 and 13 in Luke 16. He says, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Once again, that's a different verse saying the same thing. What is he saying? He said, if you can't be faithful here then you will not advance to here. And I am wanting to see God do what he's 
promised he would do in the church in the last days. We are supposed to be the most glorious expression of God the world has ever seen. Jesus said what you saw in the book of Acts and what you saw in his ministry, will far, we will far outweigh what we've read about in our generation. But here's test number one. Is he your provider? There's a scripture that says in Joshua 24, 15, choose ye this day who you will serve. And I'm telling you today, a line's in the sand. Who will you serve? Are we serving the God who provides for us, who's the God of the impossible? Or are we serving the world system? Because the world is gonna get worse, by the way. Can I tell you something that's, I don't like to prophesy doom and gloom, but it's just part of the end times. The good news is the church is supposed to prosper through all this, so it doesn't apply to you. But the Babylonian world system that's based on mammon, the spirit of mammon, all the way back to Nimrod, is about to go through a destructive phase that the Bible says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Why? So that the kingdom of God will stand tall in the earth. It is going to fail before your eyes. You, I'm telling you, the economy is not heading the right direction. And it's not to blame any. We can say, well, it's this person elected and all that. Can I just tell you something? It's already been said. It is written in the Bible. It doesn't matter what happens. It's going to end the same way. The only way we can delay it is if God decides to delay it. He said, here's how we know it'll end. When every tribe, nation, and tongue on earth hears the gospel of Jesus Christ. So our only mission is to shine light in darkness. That's what God cares about. And he will provide everything that's needed to accomplish his purpose, as long as he is your source. Wouldn't you love to have more than enough to give to every good work? Debt-free, money is not a thought in your mind because you only look to him. That's the season we're living in. And I felt a need before we go into the practical this Saturday, which is going to be so good. I've already looked at it. We even have a printout for you guys that you're going to follow through that's going to help get your money in order. Because it's kind of like saying, well, Lord, I believe that you're my healer, but you do nothing physically to change what you're doing. It's like if you eat at McDonald's three days, three times a day, for 30 days. You ever seen that show, Super Size Me? If you haven't, it'll change you. I still like Big Macs, but it, it did scare me a little bit. And that guy ate McDonald's every meal for 30 days, and his whole life fell apart. I mean, <laughs> he was like a healthy specimen, and then he was like almost dead in 30 days. So you can say, I'm trusting you, Lord, but you're still doing a natural thing that's in opposition of what God has said. You're going to get the, the results of the natural. So it's the same way spiritually. And the Lord said, I want you to give them the right perspective, because what the revival that's coming what God's about to do in the earth, the church has to be completely submitted to him because the power that we're going to be entrusted with will far outweigh anything that's ever been seen. Do you realize there was so much glory in the early church? This is the New Testament after Jesus died, Acts chapter 5, that Ananias and Sapphira just lied in the presence of the, the, the manifested presence of God, and they both died in church. Now, that's intense. I mean, that's a high level of glory. I mean, just, uh, just a short, why? Because darkness can't cohabitate with light. So if there is the light of the glory of God, then any darkness must be immediately judged and expelled. You cannot have darkness in the presence of God. So they brought in darkness and hid from God, a lie. They had hidden things and their hearts were not right. And because of that, they left. We are stepping in. I'm not, this is not to make you afraid. I'm just telling you what God's about to do is so glorious that God says, I want your hearts in the right place so that it can prosper and increase you and launch you into what I've called you to do. Don't be so caught up with all the natural things, the news cycles, the opinions of other people, what your boss says, what your family is saying, what your neighbor says. He is your source, and nothing on this earth can bring destruction into your life if God has blessed it. If God has blessed you, no one can curse you. Come on, stand up with me. As a pastor, my job is to say things that are exciting and easy to hear and things that are not easy to hear. And I just want to encourage you today. It's because God cares. And you need to hear this today and make the right choices and say, Lord, I'm moving my heart under your covering. Come on, let's just close in a word of prayer. Once again, I talked about Joshua 24, 15. He told the people of God, he said, choose this day whom you will serve. And I'm going to present that question to you today. Choose today who you will serve. Who is your provider? Who is your God? Jesus said, no one else can be God except for me. And it might take a little repentance. Repentance means a change of thinking for you to move your mind and your thought life and your trust off of anything else that's not him and say, God, I repent, Lord. I come back to you, Lord. I'm thinking my heart, my mind is all beholding you, God. You're everything, Lord. You meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory. 
Lord, you're everything I want. God, we don't just want your hand. We want your face, Lord. Lord, our hearts are like the heart of King David, Lord, a heart after you, Father. I know we're not perfect, Lord, and many of us have made dumb mistakes in our life just like David did. But, Lord, you're looking at our hearts, Lord. And you said, if your heart remains pure, I will accomplish my purposes in your life. I will get you to your destiny. And, Lord, today we just purify our hearts and our motives again, Lord. Lord, we love you so much. Come on, every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to take about 60 seconds real quick. I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to call you up front, but I want to ask you this. We're talking about who you're serving and who your provider is. And if you're in this room or even if you're online, you can send us a private message. And no one looking around, just me. If you'd say, Pastor Jason, um, I hear what you're saying. I agree with it. That's really good. But you're not completely sure that you are a child of God. You would say, man, you're talking about the end times, and that made me a little nervous because, I mean, if Jesus came back right now, I don't know 100% beyond any doubt that I will spend an eternity in heaven, that I'm his child first. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to everybody look at you. It's just between God and me and you. And you say, Pastor Jason, I want you to pray for me because I want to know that I'm saved. I want to start off right, and you don't want to, man, you're trying to get all your money straight, but you're like, I need to make sure my heart is God's first. And you want to know that you know that you know that you're saved, that you're a child of God, that your faith and your trust and your life is in the hands of Jesus and not the other. I want to pray with you from where you are real quick with every head bowed. If you'd raise your hand on the count of three, one, two, three, just raise your hand say, pray with me. I see your hand. Anyone else? You want to know, see your hand. Anyone else? This is your chance. I want to know that I see your hand. Three people. Anyone else? Four people. Come on. No one looking around but me. Time is short. This is very serious. Your soul is in the balance. Five seconds. Online, you can send us a message. Let us know you're praying this as well. You can put your hands down. Four people. Now, we're all going to pray this prayer together. This is not a magic prayer. This doesn't mean as soon as you say it, everything is going to magically be different in your life because the choice is yours to submit to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when you do, the Bible says you are a new creation. Old things pass away. All things are made new. And you don't have to ever question again, am I a child of God? Am I saved? This is the moment everything changes. Come on, let's pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I leave the past, everything behind, and I embrace you. Thank you for saving me. I believe with all of my heart that 2,000 years ago, you died on a cross and you rose from the dead for me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, four people that the devil will never have, amen. So... Now we're all on the same playing field. We're all children of God. We're all saved. We're all serving Jesus. Now here's the deal. You can give him your heart, but also give him your hand. God, and some of you might be like, man, my finances are not the issue. I passed that test, but you can't give him your marriage. <laughs> You're like, here's my, why? Because how you see him, come on, Pastor Tony preached this a while back. How you see God determines what you receive from him. We see him as savior. We even see him as provider, but I don't see him as healer of families or marriages or uh, taking care of my kids. So I want you to just practice today. Whatever you need to submit to him, you've got to do that. How do you know you've given it to him? When you have no worry or anxiety about it. So if you're still holding on to anxiety or worry or you can't let go, then you still haven't given it to God. Your marriage, your finances, your job, your kids, your car, your future, your dream, your vision, whatever it is, it all belongs to him today. Leave it at the cross. It's not, Lord, bless this thing. It's, Lord, here's this thing. It's submitting it to him. And I'm telling you, when we all have our hearts lined up, there's nothing that can hinder what God wants to do through this church. We are about to step into some serious harvest. Can you imagine what's going to happen? We have this community center. We're right on the highway here west, just a few miles from here. And what we're doing in the schools is multiplied beyond even that. It's now not just 500 kids every week that are coming to be receiving the, the things of God in public schools, but it's their entire families. And not just four schools, but it's 10 schools, 20 schools, 30 schools, and their families. There is a harvest waiting. The greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen, the Bible says, is in the very last days before Jesus returns. That's why you're still on the earth. That's why we're all still here. But first, we have to be his. We belong to him, Lord. Now, to trust God is to verbally and in your heart say you trust him. To entrust to God means to follow up with an action now. 
Lord, I entrust my marriage to you. I entrust my finances to you. You know what that is, and you have to do whatever it takes to express your faith to say, Lord, I trust you. And it's different for everybody. I don't know what God's speaking to you right now, but don't go out of here agreeing with what I say and not following through with action. I mean, I, I agree that working out, eating right will make me look the way I want to, but if I don't follow through with action and I just talk about it, I'll still suck in every Sunday while I'm talking to you. At some point, you have to follow through with actions. I do, actually. It's funny, especially with the white shirt. I was like, man, that's why I like black, because you can't tell if I'm sucking in. Okay, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would wake us up, Lord God. Lord, shake up the church in these days, Lord. Lord, I thank you that what's happening around the world, that all governments would take notice, that China and Russia and the United States government will all have to turn and recognize the leader of the earth is the body of Christ that is taking the torch and advancing the things of God in the earth, that no foe and no weapon and no hindrance and no obstacle can stop your will in these last days. Lord, we trust you and we love you in Jesus' name.